Welcome everybody to, um, to uh, this, the first of three panels on anarchist prefigurative politics, revolution and utopia. My name is Lawrence Davis and I'll be facilitating the panel. But just before we start, I just wanted to say very briefly a word, a word or two about the aims of these three panels. So I think the aim of, the, uh, of these panels is to critically elucidate the meanings, value, and functions in anarchist ideology of prefigurative politics and to explore its relationship with the ideologically adjacent concepts of revolution and utopia. But to borrow the language of the, the previous panel, uh, and in particular Darren Webb's paper, the aim really is um, outward facing and not merely um, inward facing. So hopefully these discussions will have much wider relevance beyond anarchism itself as a political ideology and a social movement. So for example, papers, uh, these nine papers will explore the relationship, the similarities and differences between anarchist and non-anarchist concepts and practices of prefiguration, its distinctive temporal structure, its historical evolution, and criticisms and responses to criticisms of anarchist prefigurative politics, amongst other topics. So we're very fortunate to have in, uh, in this, the first of the three panels, uh, our three speakers here today, Matt York, uh, Rhiannon Firth, and John Clark. And as advised by, uh, by the conference organizer, Dan Swain, what we're going to do is we're going to hold uh, questions, comments, until after all three of the papers have finished, and that's to facilitate a discussion which will touch on overlaps between the three papers. Um, and in terms of how questions can be posed, there's really, there's one of two ways. Either you can use the raise hand function, which you'll, you should see at the bottom of your screen, where it says reactions, um, there's a symbol reactions there and there's a raise hand function. And then uh, I can call on those who've raised their hand in the order in which they've been raised, or you can simply type your comment and question into the chat. And particularly if you prefer not to be recorded, this session is being recorded. If you prefer not to be recorded, that might be the way to, to, to pose a question. So our first paper is again by Matt York. Matt is based at University College Cork here in Ireland. He recently completed his doctorate in the Department of Government and Politics on the theme of revolutionary love. And he is currently lecturing in the department and working on a book length manuscript exploring the themes of love and revolution. And the title of Matt's paper is Permanent Revolution, Utopia as Process. Matt, the floor is yours. Okay, so I'm gonna to try to share my screen. Oh, fantastic. Okay, can, can everyone see that? Yes. Brilliant. Okay, so hi everybody, um, and, and thanks for inviting me to uh, the conference, Lawrence. Um, so the central problem this paper is going to take as its starting point is the nature of our current political utopias, that they are transcendent rather than grounded, or put another way, rather than here and now, they are nowhere in an ever-receding future or past, 
or otherwise in an alternate reality altogether. They are, as is becoming evident, both socially and ecologically, utterly impossible. And so this paper will argue that if we are to move beyond our current states of bewilderment, disorientation and denial, we'll need to set new political trajectories, which aim not at our current utopias that are not now and nowhere, but towards those that are both now and here, and therefore possible. Florence, did that just change? Did you see the... It did, yes. Well, oh, God, that's brilliant. So the paper will draw on a recent collective visioning project that I facilitated with a diverse group of anti-capitalist, ecological, feminist and anti-racist activists from across 14 countries. It involved a group process of intentionally generating a vision that was unapologetically utopian, while at the same time staying firmly grounded in grassroots struggle and harnessing imagination as a productive power in the pursuit of new knowledge and praxis. While not all of the activists participating in this collective visioning self-identified as anarchists with a capital A, the majority shared a common anarchist critique of contemporary governance and politics and a commitment to anarchist forms of organizing, which included um, autonomy from the state, horizontalism and direct democracy, direct action, the occupation of public space, the practice of mutual aid, and of course, um, prefigurative politics. And so what I'm going to try to do in this presentation is to bring some of the voices and ideas from these activists into a dialogue with classical and contemporary theory in order to explore the anarchist concept of permanent revolution, an ongoing process without end, as an effective model for radical social transformation. In the course of the paper, the temporal gap between current struggles and imagined futures will be problematized. Prefigurative practices will be critiqued and a politics of imminence will be explored in remedy. Okay, so throughout the collective visioning process, the question of how to get from the here of struggle to the there of free society presented a perplexing dilemma. Namazi from Uganda, for instance, argued that the reason why so many revolutionary movements have failed is because the people were clear about where they wanted to move from, but they were not so clear on where they were heading. And so she pointed out that those in power have been able to take advantage of this gap in strategy. But on further dialogue, the group wondered if it was in fact this very sense of trajectory from here to somewhere else that Namazi had talked about that illuminated a more central problem, that as long as freedom is deferred while in transit between a past we aim to escape and an imagined utopian future, there will indeed remain such a gap to be enclosed and colonized by oppressive forces. And so from this perspective, it is this very sense of trajectory from here to there and the resultant gap between the two temporalities, which obscures what might be the ground upon which free society might actually be constituted in the imminence and accessibility of the now. In his work on grounded utopias, um, the, the great Lawrence Davis builds on Kummel's idea of time as a temporal coexistence between past future and present, with the relation of these temporal components, not merely conceived of as one of succession, but also as one of conjoint existence, with both past and future intertwined with the present. So from, this, from a movement perspective, this state of profound contingency calls on us to open up many more spaces for radical imaginaries focused on building political projects in the here and now both grounded in historical praxis and extending towards an ever-changing yet hopeful future. But this relocation to the present is by no means a rejection of utopian thinking, far from it, for visions of future worlds animate struggle in the present. The real danger lies in clinging to and concretizing any one fixed vision of the future, or of course the past, as it will implicitly trap us within what David Abram has called the oblivion of linear time. It will trap us, that is, 
within the same illusory dimension that has already enabled us to lose connection with and fragment apart from the natural world. Temporarily speaking then, the most strategic location for constructing free society is in this moment, and then the next, and the next in perpetuity. And so as Anna, another activist from the UK who participated in the collecting, collective visioning explains, in her words, Acting from the here and now is revolutionary. Rather than having a fixed vision that the future will look like X, Y, Z, it is rather left open, really trusting in where we are coming from and what our intentions and motivations are. More relational, more caring. And again, such approaches should not be mistaken for a kind of tacit reformism or, or a postponement of the revolutionary transformation the world is currently crying out for. They are more in line with Proudhon's concept of permanent revolution, which, unlike the Marxist Trotskyist use of the term that maintained the need for a vanguard party seizing state control, involved the people alone acting upon themselves without intermediary. In order to break the cycle of partial revolutions we can observe across previous centuries. And so, as stressed by Jack, an eco activist who was part of the collective visioning, our struggles must remain dynamic or risk being in opposition to life and the dynamism of who we are. For him, as for many of the other activists who participated, it is therefore essential that we remain in movement, an ongoing dance grounded in the moment. And so from this perspective, any truly inhabitable utopia can therefore only be arrived at or lived as a dynamic process in the here and now. But it's also important when thinking this through to proceed with caution. Um, Yuri Gordon has argued that such a politics of the here and now might lead to our struggles becoming trapped in a recursive prefiguration in which a future radiates backwards on its past, an, an absorption of the revolutionary utopian horizon into the present tense. Such a temporal framing, he argues, works to undermine a generative disposition towards the future allowing a collective denial of both the absent promise of revolutionary transformation in the near future and the very real prospect of imminent ecological and societal collapse. And so pre prefiguration from this perspective is little more than a way of modeling an imagined future in the present moment as a way of dissociating from the very real and immediate ecological and social crises that cascade around us. Um, fiddling while Rome burns, so, so to speak. Gordon argues that adherence to such presentism sidestep these crises by avoiding any disposition towards the future altogether. Um, and, and also D Darren Webb, who, who um, I, I, yeah, I, I hoped to join the, the previous um, panel, but, but unfortunately all hell broke loose here this morning, but, but uh, I'm sorry I missed it, I'll, I'll watch it again. But um, D Darren Webb has also critiqued what he describes as attempts to reconfigure utopia and to rid it of its totalistic and prescriptive dimensions in order to avoid the risk of closure and control, and claims that such an approach merely succeeds in nullifying its utopian potential. He believes that such the, much of the vitality, power and direction that a utopian approach might offer is lost when attempting to circumvent its perceived um, bad connotations, these perceived bad connotations. And he's right when he says that without visions of the future, utopian praxis risks becoming, in his words, an empty and endless project that romanticizes the process while losing sight of the goal. And, and in his critical case study of Occupy Wall Street, he makes a similar argument, um, again, in, in his words, movements heralding themselves as cracks in capitalist space-time through which transformed social relations are emerging here and now might just end up becoming dead spaces in which the inchoate utopian desires that originally gave them life wither away through neglect. And of course, uh, once again, he, he is correct, they might, but the question is, must they? Um, are a politics of imminence and a generative praxis, as these scholars claim, really so mutually exclusive? 
The, the, the dangers are certainly real and must be taken seriously. A, a, a politics of imminence could well be, and at times is, used to provide reassurance and denial in the face of ecological and social systemic collapse. But such an impatience with our lack of a collective lack of revolutionary progress in the present, while entirely understandable, might just as easily lead us yet again towards a frozen image of the future conceived of in the past, the abandonment of the present, and the repetition of, of previous mistakes. Any future utopia we, we might imagine through the limitations of our current conceptual frameworks will inevitably at some point be found lacking as our capacity to imagine better worlds evolves beyond our original starting point, condemning us to a future caught within the paradigms of the present. For as, as Rosie Bredotti has pointed out in her words, we cannot even begin to guess what post-anthropocentric embodied brains will actually be able to think up. And so although it might be possible to identify the impacts and successes of previous struggles with the benefits of hindsight, it is never possible to envisage the whole process in advance. And so from this perspective, free society must be, can only be co-constituted right here and right now in multiple practices and forms and, and from the ground up. And the sheer range and diversity of such practices that are observable today rather than indicating a confusion or incoherence, provides clear evidence that such an approach offers a unique flexibility and applicability across multiple diverging contexts. Such, an anarchist, such anarchistic approaches are not aimed at vertical transcendence, but are rather brought back down to earth in a grounding exercise of radical imminence. And it is through the co-creation of such living, vibrant, material alter alternatives that we can tangibly express the utopian potentiality always within our grasp as an imminent feature of the present moment. And so in, in the words of Simon Springer, all we have is imminence, this, pr this precise moment of space-time in which we live and breathe. And because we are it, we can change, reshape, and ultimately transform it. And as Jack also explained, what we are bringing into perception in this moment, that is the world we are living in, and that is the relationship. And so for him, the idea of an abstracted concrete utopia to be prefigured is clearly, in his words, a bit silly. He argues that our struggles must remain dynamic or, end, or else they end up being in opposition to life and the dynamism of who we are. The anarchist theorist Gustav Landauer went so far as to claim that there is ultimately no separation between cause and effect. He conceived of cause and effect as flowing from one another, one to another in an eternal process that he called reciprocal effect. He even suggested getting rid of the word cause entirely, exclaiming, the cause is dead, long live the living effect. Inverting Schopenhauer's claim that all reality is effectiveness, Landauer instead asserted that effectiveness is reality, and therefore all that can be actual and existing is also present and in the moment. But a politics of imminence need not and must not displace the future. On the contrary, it should recognize it as an entangled aspect of what we term the present. And so what is generative must also be in process with imagined futures and an ever-changing present in a constant dialogical process. And so rather than prefiguration, perhaps a more useful way to frame it might be that of an imagined future being constantly refigured in a process of entangled relationality with the continually shifting present, which in turn refigures itself in relation to this new trajectory and so on and, and so forth. This might then ensure that the anxious and catastrophic forms of hope that Yuri Gordon rightly argues will be necessary to create the urgently needed radical alternatives to our dystopian present remain firmly grounded in the possible while generative of the, what for some might seem, impossible. From this perspective then, 
we might rethink the sequencing of means and ends from a linear to a non-linear temporal form. And so rather than prefiguring a path which leads to a particular goal, the path actually becomes the goal. And therefore, as this paper has argued, if our goal is freedom, then practices must be established which realise freedom in the present moment and not as a distant promise, as the liberation of the now and as an ongoing process of permanent revolution. Okay, so um, thanks for listening. Uh, and if anyone's interested, um, here's a link to the website of another collective visioning project that's just started off at the moment and, and it's picking up on a lot of the themes I've just been talking about. So if you're not completely bored, take a look at that website. And, um, that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. And we'll move on now to our uh, second paper in the panel. The second paper is by Rhiannon Firth. Rhiannon is a lecturer in sociology at the IOE in the Department of Education, Practice and Society. She works on, among other topics, anarchist utopias, anti-authoritarian social movements, and prefigurative politics. She's the author of the books Utopian Politics, Citizenship and Practice, published by Routledge in 2012, and with John Preston, Coronavirus Class and Mutual Aid in the UK. And she has recently completed, I don't know when this will be published, Rhiannon, uh, her second sole-authored monograph entitled Disaster Anarchism, Theory, Mutual Aid, and Utopia. The title of Rhiannon's paper today is Disaster Anarchism, How Do Disasters of the Current Conjuncture Reconfigure State Capital Relations, and How Can Movements Resist Without Being Co-opted? Rhiannon. Hello. Um, okay, I'm going to try and share my screen, but I've got two screens, so it gets a bit complicated sometimes. Uh, da, da. Okay, uh, hopefully this will work. Does that work? Yes. Is that working? Does it look like a, just the PowerPoint, or is it? Uh, it looks it looks the way it should look. I think. Great. Okay. Thanks. Uh, okay, so. Uh, I've no idea what I was thinking with this ridiculously wordy title. I don't actually even remember coming up with this title, but it does prefigure my paper, which I've not managed to cut down as much as I wanted to in time. So I might have to skip over or rush through some bits, but I'll do my best. Um, OK, so as Lauren so nicely said, the paper elaborates aspects of my book. The title has actually changed with the publisher since uh, I think Lawrence wrote that bio. It's now called uh, Disaster Anarchy, Mutual Aid and Radical Action, and it will be ready in spring 2022 with Pluto. Um, Initially, I was writing a book based on interviews uh, that I undertook with Occupy Sandy activists. Um, and I'm not going to go, uh, there's a lot of detail on Occupy Sandy in the book. I presume that people sort of know what that is here. Um, I might be wrong, but because I've got a lot to get through today, I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail on Occupy Sandy and the history of Occupy Sandy. Um, the main sort of interest of this paper is the fact that the Department for Homeland Security in the US uh, sort of published this report, well, some academics published it, but it was funded by the D Department of Homeland Security. It very much praised Occupy Sandy for their flexibility. Uh, and it was interpreted by the mainstream media as outperforming uh, established relief organisations, including um, FEMA and the Red Cross. Um, so bizarrely, all these kind of sort of hegemonic actors and agencies very much praised the movement for sort of flexibility and responsiveness um, and my book was very much about why is this you know how are these how is a radical movement sort of horizontalist movement getting co-opted into this sort of very neoliberal discourse and as I was nearing completion of 
the book, which was supposed to be finished over a year ago, uh, COVID-19 struck. Um, and this is a very different type of disaster to a hurricane, um, but it's 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 a pandemic. It's some um, traditional da- disaster studies scholars wouldn't call it a um, disaster. Uh, however, its effects in accentuating crises of capitalism and exacerbating government authoritarianism have been very similar. Um, So worldwide government-enforced public health measures have included social distancing, lockdown, telling people to stay at home, uh, emerging only for essential activity, which has meant essential to capitalism. Work, schooling and shopping are prioritised over socialising protest and attending funerals. Um, So an enormous mutual aid effort arose in the UK with the aim of providing aid to vulnerable people um, and those whose lives were affected by the virus, which includes everyone but unequally. Um, And then I sort of ended up writing this book about uh, mutual aid and COVID-19 while I was in the midst of it and decided that I had to write a chapter in, in my other book on it as well. Um, So in this paper, I've tried to focus on the implications for prefiguration. I've tried to draw together diverse strands in the book to sort of focus on prefiguration. I don't know if I've been entirely successful, but the argument is that the nature of state has shifted from a massified Fordist structure to a more decentralized post-Fordist model with cybernetic components. And the anarchists and other radicals need to recognize and find new ways to resist this and to figure these into their prefigurative visions. I argue that states no longer rely on outright repression and social control, well, only on outright repression and social control, but also even especially on new forms of biopower and surveillance. Um, And I argue this current conjecture has a basis and long precedent in a history that's often been ignored of um, disaster studies and policy, uh, currently termed disaster risk reduction. Um, so this is part of the broader uh, transformation, the, the, the border transformation of capital uh, and the relationship between the state and capital um, and the sort of, so I'll go into more detail in the book and I'm sure people are familiar with this argument, but sort of Ford, Fordism was a centralised and organised form of capitalism based on mass production and consumption. Uh, where the state acts as an organiser and stabiliser for capital through welfare functions and healthcare for social reproduction. Uh, in the late 20th century, early 21st century, uh, the development of post fordist neoliberal capitalism has led the state to relinquish, the, relinquish this role significantly, um, while manufacturing gave, rise to, uh, gave way to the service economy and more precarious forms of work. Um, okay, so... The perspective on community response to disasters that dominates mainstream consciousness today dates back to uh, the early Cold War uh, and the work of Norbert Wiener. So the behaviorist cybernetic uh, paradigm was linked to new public management discourse that continued to uh, gain strength through the 80s. And it views disasters as sudden ruptures in the normal running of events and emphasizes a rapid return to normal. Uh, a key name in this in this field is Erico uh, Quarantelli, uh, who basically, in his work, critiqued a top-down command and control approach to risk management and saw the potential for disaster planning and management to manipulate pro-social behaviour uh, in the interests of returning to normalcy. Uh, so this emphasis on sort of returning to normal, and these days we hear the, the term the new normal, Um, Such approaches rely on rational choice modelling and observed behavioural patterns, and they've got a, they're based on an ontology which has a flat view of social life, where the same motivations and structures are in play in every possible scenario, and these are equally observable and knowable in every case. Uh, The emphasis is on indirect population control through technocratic environmental design rather than earlier top-down models of command and control. Uh, Human actors are treated as externally oriented nodes located in relational or opportunity structures which constitute what they are or at least how they behave. Um, And this this sort of discourse of acceptable behaviour and unacceptable behaviour and treating people in terms of their sort of externally oriented actions rather than their sort of internal motivations and values, I think, is even filtered through to radical movements of the contemporary time. Um, So the idea is that social control can be exercised indirectly through technocratic design of the social environment without the need for direct command or dialogue. 
Um, and the influence of this paradigm on disaster studies can be seen in policies we see enforced today, particularly in attempts to recuperate the energies of radical social movements into state friendly disaster relief efforts. Uh, the approach simultaneously fuels uncertainty and security and panic, as well as authoritarianism and top down control, despite outwardly appearing to resemble decentralized organization and endowing actors with a sense of autonomy. Um, and if you read a lot of the cybernetic disaster management stuff, it, it very much reads almost, when I first read it, I found it very hard to critique because it's hard to disagree with it. It almost sounds anti-authoritarian and in a sense anarchist. Um, it gives the appearance of advocating equal treatment and a role for horizontal organizations such as mutual aid groups. However, the integration of the horizontal with the vertical is a key facet of this, and it relies on carving out a role for specialised state agencies like FEMA in the US or COBRA and SAGE in the UK to oversee and coordinate um, their actions in order to differentiate between helpful and injurious emergent actions. Uh, and then to use generic structural in adjustments such as education and nudges uh, to manipulate the beliefs and behaviour of populations and to encourage actions that are seen as helpful to the state. And we've got a whole sort of nudge unit in the UK that's uh, dedicated to this kind of behavioural control. Um, I'm going to skip through this quickly, uh, but I, it, it's analogous to the broader social capital. I call it social capital. Um, basically, the idea that... Um, uh, it's sort of the mainstream liberal consensus on the relationship between civil society and the state and the ideas that these spheres are partially autonomous, potentially con uh, conflicting, and they act as checks and balances. Um, and it deploys the assumption that social movements can be co-opted and channeled uh, or NGOized to promote cohesion development and, com and uh, community. Um, so grassroots participatory groups are thus seen as desirable, but only if they operate as components in a larger totality, which produces stability and efficiency, not as distinct social uh, subjects which pursue meaningful alternatives. Um, so the clues in the name social capital um, and a lot of it, it, it is a for, it's seen as a form of capital. You know, the, the social is useful only so so long as it. Uh, is the explicit monetization of social bonds. Um, and it's very prominent in disaster research. Um, and it's the basis, uh, it's also the basis of um, it's also the basis of securitized responses to disasters, such as the militarized policing of Hurricane Katrina and the reliance on police enforced lockdown and media induced moral panic during COVID-19 at the expense of medical and welfare goods, uh, for example, testing and diagnosis during COVID-19. Um, this is because emergent groups and social movements are understood to be helpful only insofar as they can be co-opted as social capital. Otherwise, they're subsumed in a discourse of violence, danger, disorder, looting, rioting, a force of chaos to be repressed. Uh, okay, so capitalism is becoming more crisis prone. Uh, we're currently at a critical moment of decomposition of capital. Uh, due to climate change, uh, systemically promoted fossil fuel consumption and mass production, uh, the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events is increasing, uh, globalisation has increased international travel and interconnectedness, meaning localised disasters reverberate globally, uh, infectious diseases spread rapidly, uh, the global economies become more unstable due to processes of neoliberalization, such as structural adjustment policies and so on. Um, however, at the same time, protective measures such as well-prepared health services have been corroded. Um, and I've already, I've already talked about the way in which we see new forms of cybernetic authoritarianism. And these are linked to our, uh, developments in artificial intelligence, automation and connectedness. Um, new ways of disciplining workers' time, digital surveillance. Um, there's profit to be made from all aspects of disaster, from private security and construction firms to big data and technology companies. Disaster capitalism, alongside the upheavals brought by disaster and displacement uh, of those who can't afford to ensure their livelihoods, mean that crises vastly accentuate inequality. 
Uh, billionaires, increasingly scared of the conditions they've helped to create, can hide away in bunkers and they set up charities making political choices as to who constitutes the deserving poor, uh, turning aid into a competitive and consumerist enterprise. People who are already marginalised and barely surviving the everyday disasters of normal capitalism, such as precarity, austerity and criminalisation, are usually the worst affected when disaster strikes. Um, and at the same time, the middle classes are mobilised against the working class for media-induced moral panics. For example, during COVID-19, we saw a middle class enthusiasm for surveillance. Um, one of the examples from my field work was a so-called mutual aid group in a suburban area that came to resemble a neighbourhood watch group. Uh, some of my more radical interviewees reported de-escalate de-escalating a situation whereby a WhatsApp group were planning to call the police on a group of racialized youth for hanging around on a street corner, which was interpreted as incorrect social distancing. Uh, the assumption, for example, that everyone had a safe home to go to is deeply gendered, racialized and classed. OK, so disasters problematize prefiguration. Um, anarchists understand disasters not as an exceptional rupture, but as constitutive of the capitalist world system. Mutual aid, degrowth and small scale prefigurative alternatives are problematized, are problematized by a policy field that seeks to capitalize on movement energies as social capital or free recovery in the absence of erstwhile state welfare functions, which is obviously anathema to anarchism and the origins of the concepts uh, in the work of Kropotkin, for example. Um, however, I argue in the book that um, many contemporary radicals and anarchists fetishize organization over prefigurative ethics and value um, and continue to praise the flexibility and resilience of anarchism. Uh, and I argue they're still playing catch up as their focus tends to be on resisting uh, older, massified and hierarchical forms of state domination. So I, I believe this is a theme that runs through many of the literatures on horizontalism, for example. Um, at the same time, increasingly frequent disasters and crises problematize prefiguration because prefiguration tends to presume desire or intent. Uh, however, nobody wishes for a, a disaster. So the idea that we can have some kind of desire or intent in the context of a disaster is difficult because many of the, uh, as Rebecca Solnit calls it, uh, extraordinary communities that arise in a disaster that appear to prefigure something uh, are often not politicised communities. They're local communities sort of um, organising themselves. So when radical movements like Occupy Sandy or COVID-19 mutual aid uh, plug in was a term that many of my interviewees used to existing uh, efforts. This can often be interpreted as um, some kind of colonization of local efforts uh, or vanguardism or something. Um, so organizationally, both Occupy Sandy and the COVID-19 mutual aid movements uh, illustrated how anarchist organizing models are highly effective in disaster situations ironically, often even in the terms of the state. Um, things like flexibility, efficiency, adaptability, um, and even in terms of neoliberal virtues of resilience and social capital. Um, so in the book, I try to think about how mutual aid can be understood as a space for the development of radical ethics, which expands as the state recedes. Um, my radical interviewees tended to favour accounts mutual aid that viewed it as a form of direct action um, that prefigured uh, a stateless society. Um, however, it's important not to underplay very real divisions in the movement. There were many people, I mean, there were many non-radicals in the movement. My, my research focuses on radicals. Um, and there was this constant urge to sort of not politicize mutual aid. But even many of the anarchists I spoke to felt that it was important not to do this because they didn't want to colonize the efforts. And this is something I go into in a lot more detail in my book. Um, but I think what, what I think is important is that the helping aspect of mutual aid should be linked to more radical actions such as occupations, eviction resistance, community self-defense, protests, and being explicit and vocal about radical politics. Um, uh, so um, I talk a bit about sort of consciousness raising and pedagogy and so on um, 
in the book. But I think it's important that to for people to understand that the state seeks to capitalize on all social relations. So mutual aid as community recomposition will inevitably come into contact with the state and capital. Um, okay, I'm slight, and I realize I'm slightly over. So this is my last slide. Um, so my account suggests that mutual aid needs anarchism that's both utopian and ethically oriented. Uh, the main objection is the Hobbesian argument that humans in a state of anarchy can't organise appropriately uh, to deal with global issues. So um, I was going to go into more detail about um, sort of people like George Monbiot and David Harvey, who sort of say that anarchism can't deal with climate change because it's too... Uh, it's too local. They reject prefiguration and seek instrumental approaches. Um, and, and they argue that social movements can only be a supplement to state power in the face of global problems. Um, I argue that these approaches misunderstand the nature of prefiguration and the problems with using statist means, which all too easily mutate, mutate into ends or at least unchangeable necessities. Um, so I argue that a focus on particular issues doesn't preclude an awareness of structural problems, rather downscaling and localization are effective responses to structural asymmetries. Uh, they're generally simpler to implement while once barriers are removed. It's much easier to proliferate self-sufficient eco-villages or localized food production than it is, for example, to power nor northern cities with solar plants in the Sahara or capture carbon at the bottom of the ocean. The main barriers, other than voluntary take-up, are state repression and recuperation. Had it not been for the waves of repression and more subtle commodification of countercultural movements from the 60s, uh, it's conceivable that climate change would already have been solved. Um, so I argue in the book that these arguments have been dealt with elsewhere by theorists of degrowth, and degrowth is becoming increasingly popular although many people don't link it to anti-capitalism uh, or anarchism. And I argue in the book that um, achieving a qualitatively improved or at least tolerable life without maintaining massive resource consumption is possible, but it's not something a capitalist society or a technocratic state can provide. Qualitative improvements in human security, meeting basic needs, providing meaning and satisfying desires are all possible without quantitative growth if there are moves towards economic or political dispersal, uh, for example, transferring resources downwards and or towards less alienated, more fulfilling ways of life. Um, and then I argue, uh, yeah, I'm, I think I'm going to finish there because I know that I'm way over time. Um, but the, the, the main argue is to, that we need to prefigure a sort of different form of value rather than simply um, an organisational difference. <laughs> Sorry, that's finished. <laughs> Thank you, Rhiannon. Um, and actually, you weren't way over time. You were right on time. Oh, OK. I thought I had 15 minutes and I was looking at my clock and it said 20. Not, not to worry about it. OK. Um, <laughs> you're on time. Um, and we're going to move on now to our third and final paper, uh, which is by John Clark. John Clark is Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at Loyola University in New Orleans and Director of the Leterre Institute for Community and Ecology. His publications include the book, The Impossible Community, Realizing Communitarian Anarchism, which was published originally by uh, Bloomsbury Press and recently republished by PM Press. And more recently, the book Between Earth and Empire, From the Necrocene to the Beloved Community, also published by PM Press. And the title of John's paper is From Prefiguration, to transfiguration from monad and nomad to communa. So, uh, John, the floor is yours. Okay, let's see, I'll unmute. Thank you, Lawrence. Thanks for reminding me what my title was. It's gone through so many evolutions and tra transformations. Uh, I had forgotten uh, what the theoretical title was. So I, 
hope it lives up to your expectations based on that title. So here we go. What is to pre be prefigured? What is to be prefigured? It makes little sense to speak of prefiguration unless we think about what needs most to be prefigured. Exploring this question from the perspective of radical politics calls to mind the ideas of revolutionary forebears, Marx and Bakunin concerning this issue. The former famously posed the apocalyptic alternative of socialism or barbarism, while the latter considered calling his major though never completed work, social revolution or a military dictatorship. Both thought that the only thing that was worth prefiguring was the revolutionary society, the realm of freedom that would forfend imminent catastrophe. This is certainly our prefigurative problematic today, though catastrophe has now taken on an even more apocalyptic meaning. The problematic is one of world historical, and we should even say geo-historical revolution, specifically the fourth such revolution in the history of humanity. The first was the communal or humanization revolution. It signaled the emergence of the communal person, human language, interpersonal consciousness, and human community in the form of small bands, and then more complex foraging societies. The second was the agricultural revolution that gave birth to the state and the vast expansion of systems of domination and control. RK. The third was the industrial or industrial cybernetic revolution. It ushers in the dominance of capital and megatechnics and another enormous expansion of domination. What was also introduced over this revolutionary history was pervasive ecological devastation, cataclysmic climate crisis, the sixth great mass extinction of life on earth, and looming global ecological collapse. We have entered the Necrocene, the new era of death on earth that put an end to the Cenozoic, the preceding new era of life. Our most vital need today is the coming of a fourth geo-historical revolution that will dismantle the symbol of dom system of domination, establish a free ecological society that forms an integral part of the flourishing of life on earth and thus save humanity and a significant portion of all life on earth from extinction. It is important to grasp that our challenge is to do what has never been done before in the history of humanity, to change the course of geohistory consciously and intentionally, to reach finally what has been called the end of prehistory. If we are going to prefigure anything, it is this, la lutte finale, the final revolution, prefigure this. It has been suggested that prefiguration means something like acting as if. On the one hand, acting as if can be a formula for false consciousness or abstract idealism. It occurs, for example, in the kind of liberal platitudes found in 10 things you can do to change the world lists, like planting a garden, picking up trash, recycling, et cetera. Things that will somehow help get the ball rolling towards solving the problems of climate catastrophe, mass extinction, and so forth. Thus acting as if can mean pretending that you are transforming rather than actually transforming. On the other hand, acting as if can be a formula for effective action if it means acting as if what was deemed impossible or only possible in some vague utopian future can be done here and now. There is practical wisdom in the popular slogan, fake it till you make it, which we can interpret in the sense of prefigure until you figure. This was the philosopher Pascal's insight in his famous wager. 
many academic philosophers will tell you that Pascal's wager would seldom, if ever, work in practice. In fact, it almost always works in practice. The theoretically focused academic's mistake is to look at the conceptual form of the wager concerning belief in the existence of God, rather than its practical content concerning how to change one's life. The important part is not the theological wager, but the social psychological one, a wager on the fact that if one immerses oneself in an integral world with its social ideology, social imaginary, social ethos, and social institutions, one will eventually adopt much of that ideology, imaginary, and ethos and become part of that world and its institutions. The strict definition of prefigure is to be an early indication or version of something. Prefiguration in this core sense, what I would call the strong or strict sense, necessarily has a retrospective dimension. Prefiguration truly becomes prefiguration when we see that it actually leads to figuration. However, it can still be called prefiguration in a relatively strong sense when there are powerful theoretical and historical grounds on which to believe that what it claims to prefigure has a great likelihood of becoming actual, that is of reaching the stage of figuration. However, prefiguration is often used in the very weak sense of the projection of a moral ideal onto an indefinite future. Such weak prefiguration subsists in what Hegel called the insubstantial realm of the moral moralité, rather than in the substantial grounded realm of the ethical or zitlichkeit. This ambiguity and connotation leads to the practical dilemma of prefiguration. On the one hand, it can be a more or less conscious capitulation to permanent marginality, an embrace of the politics of the gesture or a contemporary incarnation of the beautiful soul. On the other hand, it can constitute a vital element of a deeply transformative community, one that is not only prefigurative, but one might say transfigurative. To use the terminology of Élisée Reclus, a strongly prefigurative community would be more than a prefigurative community, an evolutionary revolutionary community. Such a community would learn profound lessons and take deep inspiration from the long history of intentional communities, affinity groups, base communities, and other forms of transformative communal practice. It would ground its practice in a deep critical understanding of the preconditions for social transformation and their relation to various spheres of social determination. I came to the conclusion long ago that a theory of prefiguration or social transformation re requires a developed theory of such social determination. This is not an entirely new idea. For example, it has been said that it is not consciousness that determines existence, but social existence that determines consciousness. The problem is that we have for a long time needed a less, less reductive, more complex, and more critical and radically dialectical theory of social existence, one that includes consciousness in addition to a much greater range of material factors. The spheres of determination that must be analyzed in considering how social reality is generated and how it might be transformed include the social, technological, and institutional sphere, the social ideological sphere, the social imaginary sphere, the social ethotic sphere, and finally, the social material sphere, which includes the larger context of materiality, including physical, chemical, and biological dimensions at various levels of complexity. All of these non-separate spheres must be understood as dialectically interacting, mutually determine, determining realms, and must be addressed in practice at the personal, communal, and social levels, including in their virtual and trans-individual dimensions. Furthermore, any problematic of prefiguration, figuration, 
and transfiguration must face the issues of scalability and extensibility. We must consider how a vision of social transformation can affect significant changes at every level of social being, personal, local, regional, and global, and how the process of transformation can generate non-dominating communal and ecological forms of association at every level, from small affinity groups and primary living groups to base communities and eco-villages to liberated neighborhoods, towns, cities, and municipalities, to entire liberated regions of various scales up to the global. At the same time, processes of transformation must be rapidly extensible, since our time frame for a meaning and viable solution to, let's say, the riddle of history is severely limited. Fortunately, libertarian, communitarian thinkers and visionaries have passed on to us a rich legacy of reflection on su such matters. Martin Buber said that since early in the 20th century, there has existed a feeling of living in the initial phases of the greatest crisis humanity has ever known. We can, he says, create the organic community that will save us from this crisis if this community consists of a community of communities of communities. Gustav Landauer suggested that if we create communities in which life is deeply fulfilling and in which all truly flourish, this will create a kind of positive envy in those who observe it. We can call such an effect inspiration, the spreading throughout the world of what Landauer called Geist or spirit. According to Buber, this spirit is something that is found at all the decentered centers of free community. We might borrow the concept of an eros effect to describe such a phenomenon. This unifying and inspiring effect emanates from and pervades the charismatic community that arises usually in the face of crisis out of a strong sense of common need and purpose. This communal charisma, Landauer's spirit, was identified by Joel Covell in his great work, History and Spirit, as the powerful force behind the great world historical revolutionary movements. Such an effect recurs across the span of history, but it is always threatened by what Max Weber called the routinization of charisma, in which we may also, and, and which we may also identify as the often subtle recuperative forces of reification and domination. The egalitarian liberatory community is the charismatic revolutionary subject of history. Loss of its charismatic force, loss of spirit, results in the rise of arbitrary authority, bureaucratization, egocentrism, and other evils. To avoid this recurrent danger, the prefigurative and transfigurative community will have to devote intensive efforts guided by critical reason and creative imagination to regenerating and enlivening the communization processes in every sphere of social determination. It will not, however, lack potential for drawing transformative energy from the reality of crisis in our epic of ongoing and intensifying global emergency. I will conclude with some historical examples of two. I originally had four, but uh, I've uh, left here two examples of projects relevant to our topic. The Sarvodaya movement in India developed what was perhaps the most far-reaching anarchist-inspired program for prefiguration, figuration, and transfiguration. Its program included a number of key elements that I can only mention very briefly, though I discuss them in more details in my book, The Impossible Community. These include village swaraj, meaning democratic self-rule and economic self-management in the local community, Swadeshi, the product of, project of local and regional autonomy through production based in the community's own traditional land, local self-determination through the Gram Sabha or village assembly and the Panchayat or five person village council. Budan, the gift of land to village cooperatives 
leading ultimately to gramdan or gift of village, which means the communalization of the village and all the surrounding land. The Shanti Sena, the peace army, or body of nonviolent mediators who would replace the police, the core of Grand Sevaks or Servodea workers who would organize the movement in every village and neighborhood in India. And finally, though this is far from all of the key elements of the movement, the ashram, a political and spiritual base community in which the members lived communally. In effect, a model eco village within each community. I don't have time to go into it here, but my analysis of Sarvodaya's program shows that it addresses a spectrum of spheres of social determination, such as the institutional, technical, ideological, imaginary, and ethotic in a very deep and comprehensive manner in comparison to other radical and revolutionary social movements. It is thus an important point of reference for any study of the prefigurative figurative and transfigurative. I'm particularly inspired by the Sarvodian idea of creating a vital functioning ashram or model eco village in every village, town and neighborhood. This is a wonderful example of a practical topian that is place-based utopianism. Its message is that if we really want to achieve the ultimate utopian goal, the free ecological society, we need to make it possible for everyone to walk to utopia from wherever they live. Sarvodaya, though it never triumphed in India, communalized millions of acres of land, helped inspire numerous creative projects from the Barefoot University to Navdanya Biodiversity Farm and is still alive. It leaves a legacy of wisdom concerning what a truly transformative vision might be. Lastly, I will briefly mention my neighbors a few hours away from here at Cooperation Jackson. It is perplexing that there hasn't been more solidarity by anarchists with this foremost prefigurative project in North America, indeed in the Anglosphere, although fortunately there are signs that this is beginning to change. Its informational handbook, Jackson Rising, the primary source of information on the movement invokes Bakunin and Malatesta, among other, other revolutionary figures. The organization's educational center, the Kuwazi Balagun Center for Economic Democracy and Development, is named after the new African anarchist, Kuwazi Balagun. Cooperation Jackson came out of the Republic of New Africa movement and thus has a background of over half a century of experience in grassroots organization. Central elements of its program include the solidarity economy, worker self-managed enterprises, community land trusts, and other cooperative projects, and democratic people's assemblies. Its goal is to replace the current socioeconomic system of exploitation, exclusion, and the destruction of the environment with an alternative, they say, built on equity, cooperation, worker democracy, and environmental sustainability. Cooperation Jackson works to create economic practices and initiatives that share common values, cooperation and sharing, social responsibility, sustainability, equity, and justice. It builds cultures and communities of cooperation. Much of this work is well underway. Furthermore, Cooperation Jackson is building alliances uh, <clears throat> and, and inspiring similar forms of organization in many other places with the goal of creating a larger solidarity economy and ultimately replacing the capitalist system entirely with a decentralized but network system of democratic citizen and worker controlled communities. More information can be found on their website at cooperationjackson.org. I would recommend to anyone interested in the basic liberatory and communitarian values of anarchism and in the process of prefiguration that they consider supporting Cooperation Jackson, learning from its experience and working to create similar projects wherever they are. What finally can I say? Go prefigure.
Thanks. Thanks very much, John. Um, we now have, uh, and that's perfectly on time as well. So we now have 25 minutes <clears throat> for discussion, questions. Uh, and just by way of reminder for the few people who arrived a couple minutes late, um, that you can do this in one of two ways, either through the chat function, uh, <laughs> question or comment, or using the raise hand function. Well, I don't see any immediate questions. Um, so, ah, I do, okay. Just one has appeared there. So Darren, Darren Webb. Hi there. Um, I'll start off then with a question for, for Matt. Um, and I already made a note, Matt, to go away and, and read whatever it is that you've written so far. I really enjoyed that. Um, one of the things that I'm interested in is the relationship between the academy and social movements. Um, and I'm just wondering kind of what you see the role or the dy dynamic of, of that being in the process of collective visioning and the relationship maybe or the differences between what you understand as collective visioning and what, you know, the sort of, the, the sort of vogue methodology of, of co-production. Um, and how might you mitigate against the radicalism of social movements being recuperated and co-opted by the logic of the academy? Yeah, well, no, no, that's the, <laughs> that's, that's a very good question. Um, the, the 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 methodology I'm I'm using is exactly that. Look like I'm um, at, at the moment uh, the, the 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 Deep Commons um, collective visioning project that that I, I shared the link for. Um, that's attempting, you know. So so we've got some really cool people on there. We've 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 got um, so so the what we're looking for. The the, the one question it asks is. How do we cultivate ecologies of solidarity and care beyond capitalism, patriarchy, racism, and the state? So it's a big question, but it's a clear question. And, 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 and the question itself attracts um, the kind of people, it's, it, it's, an, it's, it's an easy way to attract um, the, the, the right crowd, so, so to speak. So, so we, we've, we've got people from, you know, from Keith McHenry, who, who founded Food Not Bombs. He does a great one hour kind of um so 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 I'll, t I'll explain the project first so so what what's the there's a website which you'll visit the the first stage is is that i'm i'm doing a series of interviews with with scholars and activists around the world with an interest in this question in, in, in working out the answer to this question you know um and and that will attempt to kind of curate a space where, where there's this this dialogue going on and that next year, hopefully, will we'll then feed into more, you know, collective dialogue and, and a, you know, a, a conference or a gathering of, of that, that kind. So um, I've also got people like, like um, who, who, uh, the, um, the, 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 the wonderful Rhiannon Firth um, and, and also the, the, the amazing um, John Clark have been interviewed and they, they've given great, um, great, great ideas, you know, and... and um, and what's been interesting is as I've gone through the process, which is a wonderful process from, from my perspective, people who have been tuning in and, and looking ahead and seeing the kind of interviews that have been um, occurring have, have, um, have you know, they, they, they come into the, the interviews with, with, with thoughts around what's already happened. So, so even before we've, we've, um, we've started a, a, a true collective dialogue, there is a dialogue taking place. There's a there's a process taking place, which is really beautiful, you, you know. And, and um, the, 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 there's it, it's it's a way of it's it's completely transdisciplinary or even undisciplinary is probably the best best way of of, of putting it from a, from an academic perspective, and and it's and it's equalizing in in, in the way that, that there is no reification of the academy, and there's also no reification of um, which which is also problematic of 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 um, activism rather than you know oh god those academics you know so 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 that that's kind of sidestep through this methodology you know um, and 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 also 
it, it really expands the, 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 the question, you know, the, 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 the discussion, because loads of these discussions are going on all, all the time and we're all having these discussions. We're having them in our small groups. We're having them in, in our activist groups. We're having them in our departments or, or our, you know, the, the, the anarchist studies network might have them. Um, the, the, um, the, the, the trees might be having, you know, we're, we're all having these conversations. But what, what's, what's wonderful about this is, is that it, 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 it opens new, um, rather than being trapped in these paradigms that we are all trapped in, this opens up new paradigms. I, 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 there's a great um, interview that will be going on, hopefully, if, he, if he, he's, at, he's looking at it at the moment, by um, Richard White, who, who a lot of you might know him. He, he does great work a lot of the time with 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 um, with Springer. He, he he does great work around critical animal studies and 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 that, that those kind of things. So he's he's brought a whole new dimension into a lot of the topics that were already brought up. A whole new dimension, you know. And and so hopefully, when we finally come to together next year, that this would have. Um, this, this, this would have sowed the seeds for, for something, you know, maybe not groundbreaking, but, but something maybe a little bit useful, you know. So I, I don't know if that answers your question, but it's, it's kind of, that's what's going on. That, that's what I think, and that's what I'm trying to do about it. Thanks, Matt. Um, and uh, hopefully that responds to your question, John. We now have a question by, uh, by Dan, Dan Swain. Uh, yeah, sorry, I was muted. Thank, thanks, thanks so much for all three papers, and thanks to to Lawrence for organising them. It's been fantastic. I had a, a question for for Rhiannon about um, the the things you you were saying towards the end about um, about avoiding co optation by the by the state, which is something I've I've been thinking about a lot myself. And I was interested in how you. Um, how, how I guess both you and the people you you've been interviewing and talking to, um, you mentioned that they that 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 people were particularly talking about the importance of taking more radical actions of occupations and and, and protests and so on, and I'm interested in how they in why I suppose how they imagine that that avoids the co-optation. Was is it the sort of is it. Uh, that it's the importance of being antagonistic or is it the importance of uh, of even making demands as we talked about in the previous uh, session or or i suppose that, yeah i suppose i'm just i'm interested in sort of how um how they understand the importance of maintaining that radicalism and what that means to them if if that makes sense as a question um. yeah yeah it's a really good question actually and i'm not sure my paper today made all that much sense because i had to cut out so much detail and i was trying to sort of focus on prefiguration but actually my work is more focused on avoiding co-optation um especially in the book and so with the covid19 mutual aid movements um the movement sort of as a as a as a whole the movement was sort of almost co-opted before it even started if you see what I mean so mutual aid was not a radical concept like the people that sort of took ownership of the COVID-19 mutual aid website and movement were, were sort of more NGO people than anarchists um, and the interview the people I spoke to were anarchists because I was more interested in how anarchists were involved in interacting with this sort of largely co-opted movement um and one one of the things that that happened was the mutual aid groups were kind of organized there was this sort of umbrella website and I'm not quite sure how it all began and even people who were there weren't quite sure how it all began but mutual aid the, 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 the WhatsApp groups and things like that were very much organised according to the territorial categories of the state. So they were organised by borough and ward and, and and nobody knows why, but for some reason there was what, what everyone called the local councillor issue, um, which was um, these local councillors who saw themselves as responsible and it was mostly Labour councillors so so it was felt that the Labour Party played this huge role in the co-optation of the movement um 
And Labour Party councillors would join these groups and they'd sort of try and to varying degrees of success, often depending on how many anarchists. So even though the anarchists were a massive minority in the movement and there's um, there's a woman I'm in touch with, uh, Emma O'Dwyer, who's done this sort of much larger scale sort of um, par- partially quantitative study on the mutual aid movement that and she didn't really encounter any anarchists you know it was a very very small group within a very very huge movement um, but because you know I'm anarchist in London these are the people who are my friends that I'm in touch with so you know they're the people I in, and they're the people I'm interested in and they're the people I interviewed they they did have a big effect on the movement I think in in keeping discussions of politics and the politics of mutual aid alive in these sort of um largely sort of left liberal sort of groups um but some of the groups yeah the, these sort of local councillors joined and would sort of start insisting on people having dbs checks for example criminal records checks in order to participate in the movement which you know is incredibly exclusive um of not only people that might have a criminal record or but also because of you know refugees asylum seekers and things like that there's there's all sorts of reasons someone might not be able to get one of those but there was stuff like that so that that seemed to be the main and then there was also people who wanted the movement to become an NGO and that happened during Occupy Sandy as well there was a sort of big split between people who wanted to take funding and didn't see any problem in sort of becoming basically an NGO and people that wanted to stay anarchist and um, in the book I'm interested in how anarchists interject in these things and try to stay radical and resist recuperation and and co-optation and one of the things that seems important is and I think this links to a lot of the stuff that John Clark was saying and there was a huge chunk I missed out of my presentation in the conclusion because I was stressed that I was running out of time but the the importance of having a space um, like a squat or a social centre or an intentional community um just seems to come up again and again it it came it came up when I interviewed Occupy Sandy but it came up even more with the COVID-19 mutual aid groups there was one space in particular um grass which was green radical anti-capitalist social space which they originally squatted Paddington Green Police Station just before COVID-19 struck it's it's not a police station it's in use it was like an ex-police station and an empty police station um but that got evicted just but just as the pandemic hit and then they they got another one in Islington um in Islington of course is Jeremy Corbyn's ward and the movement to co-opt the seat that the community mutual aid groups was very much I think a sort of uh lost Corbynite movement who wanted an outlet and wanted a way to continue to be involved but they're not anarchists you know and they don't like anarchism <laughs> Um, you know, well, they do so long as it's kind of fluffy, you know, and not not about occupations or eviction resistance or so on. Um, but the, one of the movements that did manage to sort of ward off state power very powerfully was that one that was a, in, that was associated with the squat, you know. And um, there's, I've got reams about it in my book, and there was one one interview in particular was more articulate than I'll ever be. Um, so I sort of felt bad using this stuff in my book because I just thought this should just be quoted verbatim, basically. Um, but yeah, just, just the importance of having a space for people to sit together and discuss values and to store stuff, physical stuff, you know, and um, to interact, to have a visible presence in the neighbourhood. They said they had sort of anarchist flags up outside, but they were also cleaning up graffiti so that, you know, the people in the neighbourhood liked them and stuff and they said you know they didn't push anarchism onto people but people start you know they, they, they were having discussions about anarchism with people that might never have heard of it before or might have seen it as sort of bomb toting or something like that and just just having that presence so I think John John also said it a lot more articulately than I can but I think just the idea of a proliferation of kind of intentional communities squats social centers diy spaces just this importance of having a kind of project in the space and being grounded in in that physicality i guess is important does that answer the question i'm not sure if yeah yeah thank you thank you very much that's great 
Thank you, Alan. Um, we had a question from um, Puli in the chat, um, but I think you've touched on that in your response to the previous question, Rianne. It was about um, how your ideas about the implications of having a physical space relate to your topic of disaster and disaster responses. And I think you, you just actually li literally just touched on that. Um, if you want to say more um, about that, we can come to that in a minute. But I wanted to bring John Clark into the discussion uh, first. Um, and just to ask John, um, I mean, it was interesting that all three of the papers were critical of aspects or particular forms of prefigurative politics. Um, and in your paper, John, um, just after you were offering a definition of prefigurative politics, you were critical of what you referred to as a liberal form of uh, prefigurative politics, um, and specifically as, quote, simply a projection of um, uh, morality into an indefinite future. And so I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, what precisely, what form of prefigurative politics it is that you're criticizing there. And maybe also um, just to sort of connect with Rhiannon's paper, perhaps, this was an example you didn't give in your uh, paper, but perhaps you could comment briefly on um, on uh, the response to the disaster of Hurricane Katrina as a form of prefigurative politics. I think you're on mute there at the moment, John. Uh, yeah, I hope this improves uh, my participation <laughs> now that you can hear me. Um, it can work either way. Um, so so uh, the, the, you're raising at least several important questions. One is um, about the, the, the kind of um, prefiguration as false consciousness kind of critique. And uh, you know, one of the problems we have is the, the problem of default thinking. You know, they're, they're very powerful forces that shape our thoughts, our imagination, um, our practice. Uh, so we very easily slip into the default of, of conventional thinking, you know, a lack of critical thinking, a lack, lack of pushing things to their limits, and uh, we concede too much. We, we, so that, that's the problem. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if, you know, I, I, think, I think people can probably get that, that there, there's a bad kind of thinking that we don't want to fall into. Uh, a kind of abstract idealism or having our little personal religion of hoping for some kind of change without thinking very much about uh, how it could possibly happen. Uh, but but um, the other part about relating this to Hurricane Katrina and so forth, I think is very important. I really, uh, there, there are two things that I was thinking when other people uh, were, 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 were responding uh, one is about education and the other is about disaster recovery. Uh, you know, very practical questions. Um, if I could just say a little bit about both of those, because I think they're both important questions of practice uh, and the shaping of our thinking and, and uh, um, our preconceptions about how to organize things. I mean, it seems to me that immediately we have to think about the limitations of the so-called academy. You know, I, I, I quit that, I quit it about seven or eight years ago <laughs> in order to try to do things a different way. Um, it's very, very difficult to do things a different way, I find. But, but if you look at history, we have a lot of evidence that amazing things can come out of uh, more creative and more autonomous efforts. Uh, for instance, uh, Cooperation Jackson is inspired probably more than anything else by Mondragon and uh, the worker self-management movement, uh, other than the, the Black Liberation Movement, which would be their primary uh, inspiration. Uh, but but when, when, when uh, Mondragon was started, it was started with uh, a few people trying to start little co-ops, but also establishing their own school to train people for what they needed to know. 
I think that's one thing where the, basically the education system is not uh, designed to teach people about what they need to know. One of the things I, I used to ask my students, I, I told my students, there's one thing I need to tell every class, we're in the sixth grade mass extinction of life on earth. Most of the students told me they had never had a course in primary and secondary or higher education, which mentioned that fact, which is the most important fact that they could possibly be told about. Uh, so Mondragon is a good example. There, there, there are institutions like the modern school. There was one in Stelton that's been written about a lot. Um, in, in New Jersey, Black Mountain, is heading, the, these small educational institutions have had an enormous influence on the world, you know, far more than some department in a university or something of that sort. Um, so, so there's a lot that could be said about that, but about Hurricane Katrina, um, this, this, uh, this shaped all my thinking ever since in the last 21 years about organization, about life, about what's important, about what's urgent. Um, I, I work with a couple of small groups. I work with um, a small neighborhood group called the Soul Patrol, which I thought was the best local effort going on. Uh, we created our own little basically anarchist organization, which was an offshoot of Common Ground. And to some extent, I work with the Common Ground Collective, which now claims 65,000 volunteers, but it has turned into an NGO basically. And its original radicalism and anarchist inspiration is no longer present in it. Uh, but it was an anarchist inspired organization that had tens of thousands of volunteers and helped hundreds of thousands of people. At one point, it, it had programs, it was using all three floors of a, an elementary school, a primary school filled with volunteers. It had up to 1200 volunteers on uh, spring break. Uh, uh, college students were coming from all over. Uh, it was trying to establish co-op housing, which ultimately unfortunately collapsed. It was working on worker co-ops. It established a women's center. Um, it established a communication center had a very good vision that went way beyond merely disaster recovery, because we already had a disaster before Hurricane Katrina hit. You know, our, our, our society, our community was already a disaster. We have the emergency, we have the disaster. So, so I think there's a lot to learn from such projects. Where did they go wrong? What did they try to do that was right? And uh, I think the fact that they were trying to develop housing that they, were, that they were trying to develop a solidarity economy, um, that the Women's Center recognized the central place of patriarchy and the domination of women in this society. Um, all of these things indicated where we needed to go. Uh, I stressed Cooperation Jackson at the end because Cooperation Jackson is still going there. And I think right now we have to think about how we can help them go there, how, how we can follow their lead, how we can do what they tell us they need, and how we can also replicate a similar expansive far-reaching projects wherever we are. We're trying to do it in New Orleans. We have a little group right now that's inspired by Cooperation Jackson that's trying to see what we can do in our local community. Uh, so, I'm not sure how that answers the question, but those are the kinds of thoughts that occur to me when I hear this kind of discussion. And Rhiannon, you have about two minutes if you wanted to reply briefly um, to uh, Puli's comment. I mean, I think I covered a lot of that in what I already said. I mean, the main thing that I'd say is that I think mutual aid as community recomposition is always going to come into con into conflict with capital and people have to sort of realize that and prepare for that and it seems to be more and more and it sort of frightens me how little space there is anymore for squatting and for radical projects and um I don't know I think that's that's something I'd really be interested in getting involved in future projects with people and talking about is how how we resist the sort of constant increasingly rapid kind of eviction of spaces and just shutting down of radical action before it even starts um and and you know the cooperative movement um 
I think is one of the most important things, which I hope is going to be an increasing presence as the state withdraws more and more. But um, yeah, <laughs> that's I, I, I don't know what what more I have to say about that. Just um, just so I'm I'm quite I'm I'm a bit scared about <laughs> about the current the current ability of movements to sort of organise and keep spaces. Uh, it might just be because I live in London and how fast it's gentrifying and how fast the sort of building and knocking down of things is is occurring. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm gibbering a bit. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> well, I think we um, and somebody says, yeah, definitely. Well, it's definitely not just London, um, which is certainly true. Um, well, I think we're gonna we have to finish there because we have to finish at at uh, two thirty or or um, three thirty uh, broad time, um, and I just want to thank uh, our three speakers: so Matt York, Rhiannon Firth, and John Clark for a wonderful conversation, uh, and uh, and to you, the audience, and to remind you that the uh, the next panel will be in 30 minutes time on the theme of refusal, dissent, and withdrawal. And we'll have our second um, anarchist prefigurative politics revolution and utopia panel tomorrow. Thanks very much. <laughs>